Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are um, really excited about this presentation. My name is Kristen Solomon, and I'm the Director of Operations for the Guardian Ad Litem Program. I'm joined by our Executive Director, Alan Abramowitz, and Dr. Patricia Babcock, the Deputy Secretary for the Florida Department of Children and Families. And Dr. Babcock is gonna be our main presenter today as we talk about sibling relationships and planned transitions for children in care. And this topic is really important to us here at the Guardian Ad Litem Program as we work with thousands of children across the state. And sometimes they are not placed with their siblings. And what does that look like from the beginning? How does that affect our advocacy for our children? And how do we plan for transitions when we are moving children from placement to placement? So I know um, Alan wanted to say a few words to you all. Again, thank you for joining us today. It's really important topic and I'll turn it over to Alan. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Babcock for uh, taking this, this on. You know, normally we say that an expert is someone that comes from out of state to talk here, but we're very fortunate. We actually have the expert on transitioning siblings. This is your wheelhouse. So even though um, you are often another party, Department of Children and Families, uh, you are the one that knows the evidence, you've done the research, and what you're gonna be given are our advocates, our child advocate managers, our volunteers, our attorneys, uh, the background for what is the right thing to do according to the law, evidence-based practice. The other thing I wanna say is, you know, we talk about implicit bias a lot when it comes to racial and other issues, there's also some bias when it comes to siblings. A lot of people have strong bonds with their siblings, other people don't. We have a lot of volunteers and staff out there. We need to put our own views aside and listen to what the expert says about these relationships and why, and also about transitioning. And um, that's really what I wanted to say. And again, I appreciate you doing this. This comes up from time to time. It's very complicated. It, you know, Sometimes sibling groups are large. Uh, the definition of sibling in the statute is broader than anyone could imagine the definition of sibling would even be. And so it's all yours, and I'm going to take my face off of here, and we're going to focus on your presentation. Everyone listen up. This is important stuff today. Yes, thank you. And Dr. Babcock, can I go over a few housekeeping rules before you, you start the presentation? Absolutely. Wonderful, thank you. Um, as you all know, with our webinars, you are automatically muted. So if you have a question for Dr. Babcock and we will address them both during the presentation, if she feels that we can talk about it during that point in time, and we'll have a time for questions at the end, um, please use the question section on your taskbar on the side. And there are also handouts there that you can download with sibling issues and sibling relationships and transitions, which will be the PowerPoint that you're gonna have here as well. So you can download the handouts, type in your questions here, and we'll get to them throughout the presentation. This webinar is slightly longer than some of our others. So Dr. Babcock has built in a break about halfway through. So if you need that, we will have that about halfway through. So I just wanted to kind of go over that with all of you. I will also say goodbye from video and Dr. Babcock, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, thank you so much for, for one, giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you all um, about sibling relationships, sibling separation, et cetera. You know, so let me just tell you a little bit about myself um, and not necessarily from the you know, deputy secretary, but from more the, the personal side of the house. Um, within my, my family structure, we have had two, two children adopted out of the system. Both of them um, came right out of the hospital, substance abuse, went right into two separate family member homes. Um, one was a, a classic from beginning to end by the textbook, um, probably 13 months to permanency, um, moving right along. She subsequently um, was adopted and there actually was a, another sibling born um, four years later. And my, my in-laws, um, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, they, they really struggled with whether or not they could bring another child into the home and they did not. Um, my other niece um, was born um, and went into my sister's home 
and was in and out of her home. Um, and my sister at her at that time, you know, she and her husband had already retired. They were in her, their 50s and, you know, had decided that they, they were willing to adopt um, my niece and subsequent very close, probably, probably within a year of the adoption, another child was born. Um, and once again, they made the option not to, to bring in the sibling. Um, so that's, you know, that's two illustrations of, of babies, if you will. Several years ago, um, I was at a conference and I met this young man who had uh, aged out of child welfare and he and I just kind of struck up a conversation. Um, it was the Monday of Thanksgiving week. And so, you know, naturally I say, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? And he said, nothing. I don't have any family. I was in foster care. I don't have anywhere to go. Well, that kind of was the end of that. Um, and, and he became part of our family. The, the really ironic thing um, about Jonathan is he went into foster care at age five um, as a, a only child and his parents subsequently had, between the two of them, had nine more children. He never was placed with any of those nine children. However, they knew each other through, through the foster care system and now as an adult, He's very, very close to those four, four siblings, um, you know. And so when I when I started thinking about what I know about sibling connections and the the foster care system, and coming to do this, you know, this presentation, I thought how how ironic or or fraudulent, if you will, that I'm coming here to talk about sibling relationships, sibling separations. But I fundamentally believe siblings should be kept together. But I also know that there's times when, when we're not able to keep them together. So I, I, I share all that with you to say that this is not an easy, um, an easy topic uh, to approach. And, and that lens that you have to look at is obviously through the legal lens, as well as what I would say is the, the clinic, clinical lens. You know, what's best for, for children from a, a developmental perspective? So going into what, you know, kind of what I hope to achieve today, um, you know, five things. Um, provide a framework for understanding the importance of sibling relationships. Provide some guidelines for assessing sibling relationships, some guidelines for transitions, and identifying and addressing stress factors. At the end, I'm really going to do a piece about you, uh, about taking care of you. And then really for me, whenever I do um, a presentation, the one thing, if I, if, if I have to hit just one objective, I really wanna hit the objective of getting you to think about the way you think about sibling relationships, especially as they relate to the dependency system and what we do and don't do um, with our children from a policy and practice perspective. And within that policy piece, I'm not talking just about, you know, our rules and our OPs. I'm talking about our statutes um, and our federal regulations. Before I start, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to tie things together here, but I wanted to kind of catch you up on some things that are going on at DCF, which will actually impact, impact you and then dovetails directly into this conversation about siblings. Um, we adopted the four disciplines of execution. I, I don't know um, if anybody wants to just jump in and in, in chat or give me an answer. I don't know if um, Guardian Ad Litem is doing it anywhere in the state, but we've adopted it as an agency from a top down all the way across programs. And the, the idea, if you will, or the principle, if you will, is that, that if you laser focus on, on specific, they're called, um, war wigs, um, wildly important um, goals and battle wigs, that you really hone in your focus that you can move the needle much quicker and have a greater propensity for greater out improved outcomes if you stay laser focused as, a, um, as an agency. So the goal that the secretary set was to decrease the number of families in crisis by 20% by 2022. Keeping in mind, we did all of this before COVID hit and we're right now discussing whether or not that's where we wanna stay. 
But underneath the umbrella of that, that large wig, if you will, the, the war wig, are two battles. Um, the one battle is to um, increase our prevention touches by 20% by 2022, trying to keep those folks out of our programs. And on the other side, once they do come into um, the dependency system or the ESS system or the SAMH system, we want to decrease reentry on the other side. So we're really looking at prevention and reentry. So keeping folks out of our systems and then once they come in, um, making sure they don't come back in. And the way that we're doing this is primarily through care coordination. And you should, on the child welfare arena, you should, by the end of this year, from the DCF perspective, we do have some, um, some case management agencies that are joining us, CBCs. You should see some very big difference in the way that we do work, especially from the hotline. Um, getting those folks who we don't, don't meet the threshold of a screened in and or once we do the investigations, there's no findings. That doesn't mean that those families don't need something. So we're really going to be um, ramping up care coordination in a, in a different manner than we ever have before. The, the next one, I don't know if you have heard of the Faith and Community Initiative, and this will tie directly to sibling placement. Um, this is Eric Dellenbach. He works out of the governor's office and he is working directly with the churches and the community um, partners that we have to do one of two things. One, to increase the number of foster homes and adoptive homes and two, to increase our ability to access services that our families need. Um, and we're doing this through two different pathways. One is called Aunt Bertha. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of it. If you haven't heard of it, um, just Google it, put in your zip code. Um, this is a way to access services and or items that you need. And then the, the care portal is a way to access, I believe um, Eric has says there's 32,000 churches that he will be working with. This will be launched in August um, with the whole idea that we are just gonna go hard with, we've got to have more families to step up and become foster parents. Um, we also are stepping up a first impression call center so that if I think I wanna be a foster parent or an adoptive parent, there's gonna be one number that I call into and then that, that number will be routed to the right, right place. Um, as most of you know, COVID has, has, has forced us to change the way that we do business. Um, we now are doing telehealth or televisits, even in our child welfare arena. Um, and some folks are, are concerned that once we get our kids back in school, that we're gonna see some changes um, or an uptick in our abuse and neglect. Um, so we're, we've got a keen eye on that, but we also want to utilize televisits um, and then telehealth on the, the behavioral health side. But the, as we think about siblings and we think about sibling separa separations and the importance of visitation, we really have to start thinking about, and COVID has taught us this, what are we doing to maximize the technology that we have um, and enhance those, those visits? Uh, the next bullet you'll see is FFPSA, um, the Families First Prevention Services Act. And this is really gonna change the way that we do business. Um, we are going to be limited in the types of group care that we can utilize. Group care can no longer be um, a, a convenience placement. So right now, I'm gonna show you some numbers a little bit later, you know, right now we use group care for some of our large um, sibling groups. Well, FFPSA is not going to allow us to do that any longer. Um, we will have a max of 14 days in group care unless they need residential treatment or they're at risk of trafficking or they're a pregnant teen. Um, and we also are going to have to use evidence-based practices. So lots of things going on um, just external to our conversation today, but is going to impact pretty significantly in the next year what we're talking about. And then we have the law that passed, the year in the life of a child. And this comes back to that, 
that we've got to start early thinking about what are we doing with our, our sibling groups. Um, when they come into our care, are we doing everything that we can to have them placed together when it's appropriate to have them placed together? Because we've got to hit that that 12 month permanency mark um, and th there'll be much more um, oversight on that, if you will. One of the things that I have pushed hard and I do wish that I could see everybody's faces. Um, I was, I, I have not worked as an investigator or a case manager by, by trade, I'm a clinician. I'm a, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, and my, most of my career has been spent working with the child welfare system and the dependency system. Um, and one of the one of the things that I did not know um, when I came in was that if you remove a child from the home, so that's on us, the PIs and the sheriffs, if you remove a child from a home, we allow up to 60 days for a case transfer into case management. I, I just find this very disheartening. Um, and, and now that we have this year in the life of the child, I don't know how we can wait 60 days when we have said there is an issue that is taking a child from their parents. But even more so important, as we're talking today, as soon as we, we remove kids from home, so we're removed from their parents, and then secondly, we remove them from their siblings, the amount of trauma that we have introduced very early on in the system to wait 60 days before we really start to think about how, how are we appropriately treating and addressing just the trauma um, to me is just, is just not right. So I have, um, I have directed our Office of Child Welfare to change that, that policy and that practice and probably by October 1, any child that's been removed from their home, within seven days, that case will be transferred to, to case management for services. I think this is going to make a very big difference um, in a lot of areas, but especially with our children um, who are separated right at, um, right at shelter because we don't have um, enough placements. So I hope that you can see all of this dovetails together. We're trying to build up um, our capacity for foster homes. We're staying laser focused on prevention, trying to keep kids from being removed from their homes at all. And when they are trying to keep them from coming back in, that case transfer piece, getting the kids and the parents um, the services that they need and, and um, doing it upfront and fast. And then lastly, this year, I think that we're you know, we're going to have a staunch supporter in um, the Senate with the Senate president. Um, his entire focus is going to be on permanency. And he's very, very interested in what we're doing and not doing with, with the sibling connections, as well as with those children who have been a, a, a stable foster home for a long period of time. And when the case is TPR'd, who, who's the best placement for them at, at that point? So I'm going to address all of those areas um, today as I continue in the presentation. So just a little bit about me um, and, and to understand kind of what my thought process is um, as I, you know, build, build presentations and review, you know, review literature to kind of get ready. So today I want to start just a little bit with understanding what a system of care means um, from my perspective making sure everybody understands the impact of trauma and ACEs, um, the role of attachment and entombment. And then I'm going to introduce a concept that I, I don't know if you've heard before, but it's called inverting the pyramid. So this is just a framework before I really get into the nuts and bolts of, of what I really want to talk about and what you all, you all came to hear about. So when you think about the child welfare system, you typically think, I, I think you typically think about the green section over there. You know, you've got the child, the family, and then you have over in the green system, you have the, the dependency system. We also have some kids um, who are in the juvenile system and then some of their parents are in the criminal system. But we, we do a, a large part of our discussion, our training, our focus in there. I, I see the system of care as something very, very different. 
by the time a family comes to our attention, it's very likely that they have been in front of the attention, you know, they've had the attention of the healthcare system, especially through their, um, you know, their OB and their pediatrician, um, family, family um, practitioners, you know, their primary care. We also know that the vault the the mass uh the volume of folks that come to our attention have mental health and substance abuse issues so we know that they more than likely have um come into touch with the healthcare system over on that end we also know that a large number of the families that come to our attention have already been um in the education system whether it's in a child care situation early learning situation or even our k through 12 piece. Um, and then we, we definitely know that out in the community, there is a community system that knows this family. Um, and it could be just through prevention and awareness campaigns, through their faith-based organization, and even through some of the economic opportunity um, uh, programs that are out in each one of those communities. So then if you look over in the support services section, you see the family support. Um, and I don't know why some of this has been cut off, but, but this is the other pro, some of the other programs um, through DCF. This is where our Medicaid um, and ACA steps in. This is our, our food steps or our TANF. So I see the child welfare system as, as the last step. Um, because we've had all of these other folks who have been in, involved with this family long before they come into our attention. And so as we think about what can we do and where can we go, at, especially as we're thinking about where to place siblings, how to find those folks um, who really know the family, I think we've got to, we've got to step back and rethink about what is our system of care and look at each one of our our, our our partners, if you will, the education, the community, the healthcare, the support services, and definitely that family, that's where that, that kin and relative comes in. So when I talk about the child welfare system, I, I am encompassing way more than what we typically think about. Um, when we talk about trauma, the impact of trauma, we do so much talk about um, trauma, um, early trauma, especially on you know, our very young kids. And I'm making an assumption that most of you have heard of your adverse childhood experiences. Um, but what we know from trauma is that when children come from unhealthy environments, the impact of those environments without there being some protective factors or protective capacities or protective relationships in place can be lifelong. Um, and so thinking through every step of the way are we are we inducing or introducing new trauma to children as we make moves as we think about not keeping children together as a sibling group and or as we think about not thinking about bringing them back as a sibling group i'm assuming most of you are familiar with the the adverse childhood experiences um, pyramid but you can see here that if this happens very early on you've gotten disrupted neurodevelopment there's social emotional cognitive impairment you've got this adoption of health risk behaviors disease disability and social problems all the way up to early death and so if you go back two slides to the system of care we as a system have to think outside of child welfare and think about how does this disruptive neurodevelopment impact education, impact health? Um, you know, each one of these is interwoven, interwoven, if you will, um, and making sure that we really understand trauma and ACEs and how do we minimize them? You know, any, any child that comes into the system, no matter what the age, already has one ACE. And we know that four or more, with four or more ACEs, the outcomes are get worse. Um, and so we've got to think about, is a sibling separation one more trauma, or is a sibling removal from a stable home one more trauma? And, and is it worth the cumulative effect of those 
traumas. Next thing I wanna talk about um, so that we're all, you guys understand where I come from. Um, we do so much talking in child welfare about attachment and attunement. And um, I, I just read a report the other day all about attachment, um, said absolutely nothing about the child. It was all about the parent and the, the attachment of the um, parent, the, the parents. So I want to I want to talk about what attachment really is. You know, attachment is reciprocal, and especially as our kids get older, um, we really have to think about the you know the the bio parents as well as the foster parents as well as the adoptive parents. As, as a parent, I can have you know what what we think of as a healthy attachment to you. I, I'm meeting your emotional and physical needs. Um, my relationship with you from my perspective is pretty profound. There has to be a reciprocal mechanism here. You may feel that way about me, but I may not feel that way about you. I may have had that, that profound attachment with my biological parent, I may not have it with you, I may have it with somebody else. And so as we think about moving kids around, and, and I read so many reports and I've done, done so many best, best interest assessments, we really have to look and think about how are we making sure that it's reciprocal, that those feelings go back and forth, and it's profound, it's a profound relationship between each other. And then the last thing to really think about as we're making these critical juncture decisions, understanding that breaking attachments or forming new positive attachments set the stage for all future relationships. If we continue to break positive attachments, we, we potentially are setting the stage for all future relationships to have some problems. But if we set the stage for healthy ones, the, the opposite is true. So what is attachment? You know, it's dependent on the child and the parent's temperament. We all know if any of you have children, you know at different times of the day, you are a different parent and your child is a different child. Um, and so that temperament of, of both the child and the parent is going to impact attachment. Also, the responsive capacity of the caregiver, especially when children are very young. If, if we don't have caregivers that can be responsive and consistently responsive to kids, kids will just withdraw. Um, and that's, that's where we start to see some attachment issues. And then attachment is definitely, definitely dependent on separation of the child from the caregiver. If, if we if we in, you know we intervene or we interrupt that continuity of care, we risk secure attachments being formed in the future. So what are the different types of attachments? So obviously the, what we're what we're shooting for is that secure attachment where every everything is great, um, responsive, loving, reciprocal. The 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 child feels free to really go out explore and be a child. That's, you know, that's where we're, we're headed. But what we sometimes see with our kids that have been in the child welfare system is the avoidant or the ambivalent and anxious. So the avoidant is one that will just deny physical contact, kind of avoid relationships and be very distant. Whereas our ambivalent and our anxious kids are those slow, inconsistent, they're awful, often fearful, um, and they'll vacillate between closeness and resistance. And I, I, I think, um, and, and there is some literature out there to support it, that this really is, is a large number of the kids that we see. Um, if you just think about it from a, a logical perspective, especially those kids that have been in and out of the system and or have been in and out of relationships with adults that have not been consistent, um, have not been secure. So, so you just don't know who or what to expect. And then when we see those kids that have been, you know, chronically abused, chronically neglected, we see that they cross all three. And these are the kids that can be depressed, inhibited, 
clingy underachievers and just have very low motivation. Attunement. Um, once again, I hear a lot about attunement. And so when, when we talk about attachment and attunement, they go hand in hand. And if you think about attunement as that, that dance of social emotional interaction, um, you know, and are we able to read and appropriately respond to social emotional cues? I think, I think most of you, when you look at this picture, there's, you know, there is an assumption that dad is responding to the baby. What are the babies responding to dad? And, and I say that tongue in cheek, but, but kids that grow up in homes where there is, you know, either drug, you know, drug abuse, mental health issues, sometimes the kids have to make that adjustment that attunement piece, not a healthy attunement, to adjust and appropriately re respond to social emotional cues that are not healthy. And so we really have to, to think about that. Attunement also happens in sibling relationships. And we never ever talk about that. We don't talk about attachment with the siblings, but we never talk about the attunement piece. Um, and so we, we'll talk a little bit later about as we make assessments about where kids could and should be, um, what that attunement could look like. And this is, this is one of my favorite slides and I'll tell you my, one of my favorite stories. So attachment and attunement goes well beyond the parents. And so as we think about attachment and we think about removing kids, every time you remove a kid, um, you have the possibility of removing them from obviously their parents, their siblings, their relatives, their neighbors, their communities, and I have the pets there too. I don't think we give enough credence to pets, but I don't think we think about attachment and attunement and removal much further than removal from parents. And so I'll, 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 tell, you a, I'll tell you a story and it's really a commute, more of a community story that I was, um, my area of expertise, if you will, is um, infant mental health, working with, with young kids and, you know, in a dyadic. Um, and so we were meeting, the, the foster mom would bring a three-year-old up to the visitation center to do the therapy with, with the mom. And it was just awful. The child would arrive screaming, just totally screaming. Um, the foster mother said, foster mother said she doesn't know what happens but gets the child in the car child drives up the it was on the country up the highway and they hit this stop sign and he just does the freak out and he freaks the entire time until he gets to the visitation it was taking us forever to um calm him down we we talked through with the mom kind of what was happening, the bio mom, and where it was happening on the road. There was only one road in um, to the visitation center. And sure enough, what we realized was he was doing, starting his freaking out, if you will, his crying um, when they got in front of a Tom Thumb because the mother had a history of stopping at the Tom Thumb, buying him a bag of cheese balls. I'm three years old. I know no judgment there, a bag of cheese balls and a, a grape drink. And that was, that was what his cue was. Here I am, I usually get my cheese balls, I usually get my grape drink here. Where's my mom? Where, where's my, my community piece? Um, and so guess how it was resolved? The foster mom had cheese balls, had a grape drink, gave it to him, Everything was calm. We got to the visitation, everything was calm. And so that attachment, that attunement, it's so important that we think about it as we think about moving kids around. And then this is that inverting the pyramid that I said, I don't know that a lot of you have, have heard of. And this is Patty Babcock, um, some of the, the research that I've done you know, if you think about a typical child welfare uh, pyramid, the bottom is usually safety because we are so focused on safety. The middle is permanency and at the very top is well-being. I fundamentally believe that as a system, a large system, 
if we would shift our focus to the well-being of the children and the families that we serve, the safety issue would move to the top of the pyramid. We would see better permanency outcomes um, and we would see better well-being outcomes. And what I'm going to present in a few minutes is we know from a well-being perspective that siblings have better well-being outcomes when they are placed together. But you can look across the, the research that the, the positive things that systems do have a greater impact on well-being than, than we then we collect, you know, then the data that we collect because we're only looking at well-being from the lens of what the feds collect. That's going to the doctor, getting your dental appointment, going to school, and then if you're in independent living, getting your independent living. So, so as I said earlier, one of my objectives is to get you to think about the way that you think. And as you're going out into homes and you're meeting with families, what is your thought process? We all immediately go to safety. Are the kids safe? but are, are we focusing enough on well-being? All right, now I'm, now I'm getting, getting into why, why you showed up today. So I'm assuming that I was asked to come and do this um, presentation because of some of the tough cases that I have worked in my life, um, some of the tough cases that Garden Ad Litem has reached out to me about, CBCs have reached out to me about, the, the court um, has reached out to me about, and they fall into some of these categories. Um, I could have missed a category, and I'm happy to talk about it during the question piece, but it's, it's our siblings who were not placed together initially. Um, it's those infant, uh, those situations where an infant is born when the siblings are already in care. Those situations where the age difference is pretty significant, whether it's an age difference between two or many kids. Um, I come from a family of eight kids, all same parents with a 20 year age difference. Five of us are within about nine years. Then there was a long break and the other three were in four years. Um, and so that age difference, I often think about what would the child welfare system do with my family of eight with the um, with the significant age difference. Um, the other piece we see is the level of need, the variance. Um, if we have a sibling group where a, a sibling has a, a higher level of need in terms of um, whether it's a, a medical complexity and or a behavioral health issue, do we keep those siblings together? Um, the, next, the next tough case that I, I've worked is the adoptive parent wants to adopt only the child in their home, even though they, they knew there were other siblings out there and there has not been an identified adoptive home for the other siblings. And the next one is there is a sibling group in a home. One child is disruptive in the home. Do you remove them all or just the one? And then the last one is, I think, um, probably the, the toughest ones, and I feel like I'm, I'm probably going to get the most questions on this one, that there's a, a lack of buy-in on the plan for the siblings or the transition plan. And that buy-in can come from across the system. The buy-in can be the foster parents. The buy-in can be the guardian ad litem. The buy-in can be the case management agency. The buy-in can be from the judge. And so if, if there's not a, a unified front, who, who takes the lead? Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But those, you know, those are the cases that I think are, are the toughest cases as we think about where to go from here um, and, and what to do. So I want to make sure everybody's on the same sheet of music in terms of what are our requirements here in Florida? Um, so by statute, we've got to make every possible effort to place siblings together um, in an out-of-home placement or a permanent, the same adoptive placement. That is by statute. Um, we have to place a priority on the placement with a parent or legal guardian, responsible adult relative, or the adoptive 
parent of the child's sibling. So we, if we have a child going back to, there's a child that comes in um, after maybe ca a case has been TPR'd, we've got to do everything that we can to try to, to convince those adoptive parents to bring in this new um, child, much like my relatives that I told you about early on. Um, this third bullet I think is so important. State law also defines reasonable efforts to maintain sibling bonds that shelter. I'm sorry, I, I can't read it because it's locked. Um, state law also defines reasonable efforts to maintain sibling bonds at shelter to include the use of short-term group homes that can accommodate a sibling group. Please note what it said, short-term. It does not say long-term. And what has happened is we are seeing that, that expansion of group homes specific to sibling groups so that we can accommodate them versus looking for a long-term foster home that may turn into a, a adoptive home or a permanent guardianship. And then the last one um, says that uh, we have to prioritize sibling bonds and reunification by requiring the department to update the court on efforts to reunify siblings or if it's been determined to be in the best interest of one of the children to remain in a separate placement, any and all efforts, efforts to encourage and facilitate sibling visitation. And so you may find it interesting that the feds right now only have a requirement of sibling visitation once a month. Um, and you know that, that's probably for another conversation, but I don't know how that encourages um, you know, a sibling relationship, just seeing them, them once a month. And we also have to make sure that we have all these expectations in our, our contracts. And then the feds basically say the same thing, that we've got to have those same reasonable efforts to keep those connections in place, um, making sure that we have frequent visitation. Um, once again, they say frequent visitation as at least once a month. I mean, obviously it can be more. And this is all under the Fostering Connections to Success and, and Increasing Adoptions Act of 2008. When you look at FFPSA, um, Families First Prevention Services Act, what they are doing is they are increasing the number of children that can go in a family home. So they're increasing that numerical gap so that all the siblings can stay together. Um, I believe that the conversation right now is that we can cap now at, at six um, under FFPSA. And then um, you all can you know, read the rest that um, I have attached as a handout, the sibling issues in foster care and adoption. Um, it's a really good article. Part of FFPSA is Commissioner Jerry Milner from the Children's Bureau. He has been out there just pushing, pushing, pushing over the last 24 months, um, the importance of maintaining and strengthening uh, sibling bonds. I think the impetus for the group care reduction um, through FFPSA was specific to forcing us to really think about foster homes, foster placement for, for more than one child. So how are we doing as a state? Um, I think this will find, Surprise some of you all um, when we look at permanency. So across the state, um, between 65 to 85% of the kids that come into our attention come in as part of a sibling group. And there is this, um, I don't know what the word would be, there is this, this misnomer out there that our, our sibling groups are not reaching permanency at the same rate as our single case kids. Um, it actually is not true when you look at the, the permanency rates. So when you look at permanency for one child in 1920, we were at 38.72, for two children 40.95, three children 38.96, and believe it or not, for four children for large sibling groups, the permanent we reached permanency in 12 months for 41.22% of those kids. And then when you look at the 12 to 23 months, you find um, you find that once we get to the three and the four, we aren't having um, as good, good as luck, as you, if you will, as those ones. 
But then what is interesting is when you go beyond 24 months, the permanency rate for a single child is only 40.41%, whereas two children's at 55.38, three is 54.32, and four plus is 51.77. So we are getting kids to permanency in sibling groups, um, which, which is, is very good news. Um, so this problem is, is not as prevalent as some folks think. It just makes the press a lot of times. And so we were, we were talking a little bit earlier about what really constitutes a, a sibling relationship. Um, it can be challenging because I think the law defines it one way, whereas children and families may define it another way. Um, and I'm going to go through the different types of siblings, but you know, you've got your biological siblings, your step siblings, your foster siblings, and some folks even view close relatives or non-relatives with whom they live as their siblings. And so we have, we have a different makeup of families today. And so that, that true definition of sibling, I think is something that we really need to think about um, as we move we move forward and we think about placement, not only of who's been removed from the home, but, but are there folks out there, non-relatives, who, who also are identified as a sibling who may be able to take in a child, older sibling. Um, and then that fourth bullet is, we've already alluded to earlier, that they may have siblings that they've never met. Just because of the way families are structured today, um, and or if children children are TPR, they lose contact with you know their family, and then there's another child that is born and maybe comes into the system because we're supposed to reach out and and place kids with them. Um, there's a whole whole another subset of kids out there, but you can read the you can read the last bullets. They should ask children about who they view as their siblings and strive to help them maintain connections even when some siblings fall outside of their jurisdictional legal definition. I think this is especially true of our older kids. Um, you know, they probably have some friendships that are as strong as sibling relationships. So just, um, you know, for definition, as you think about what are the different types of sibling relationships and how 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 it impacts the ability to make decisions and so we obviously we know we've got those biological ones the full where we have same mom and dad half is where you have you know one parent is the same the other isn't but we also have foster siblings um and i think this is something that we really have to think about as we're assessing post tpr what we do with siblings we really have to assess the relationships with the foster siblings. I'll give you a, per, a, a real case example. I was asked to do a best interest assessment on a little boy that was almost three, um, born addicted, and another born addicted, went into a foster home with, with two young biological kids already in the home. Um, stayed there for three years, so he had a three-year relationship with his older foster brothers and sisters, mom in and out of the system, um, substance abuse issue. They TPR the child that I, um, that, that I was asked to do the best interest assessment on. Mom subsequently has another little boy um, and the system wanted to put the kids together because they knew that they were headed down a TPR for the younger one. The family with the boy that I was doing the best assessment on didn't, did not have the, the capacity. They didn't have the room, they didn't have the funding, they just did not want to bring another child into the home, but they very desperately wanted to raise this little boy um, as their own, who they have known as their own for almost three years. The court decided to remove him from the home. Um, and. Uh, you know, you, you you think about that right there. there there's no relationship. They're half siblings. Um, you you break the relationship with the with the foster um, parent, and then you 
you know, you've got this whole other set of, you know, you've got the legal siblings that are your step and your adoptive siblings. And then they have what's called KIF. Um, and these are those informal connections um, and extended family networks, like I was just saying, that 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 is sometimes considered in, you know, in some cultures as a sibling relationship, just as strong as a sibling relationship. So when we think about where to place kids, um, when to make those hard decisions about where kids need to be, it's really thinking about the whole big picture in each one of these categories, who fits into what category, what's the level of attachment um, within each one of those categories, and then what is the level of attachment to the, to the caregivers. So why, you know, why are sibling relationships are important? I think any of you that have had siblings, you know that this is a, a buddy to explore environments, um, to navigate social and cognitive changes, learn new skills. Those of you that are, you know, are younger siblings, how much, how many of us have learned, you know, even just, you know, sports skills from our older siblings? They're not always positive, but we, we learn skills. Um, it also is a source of continuity through a child's lifetime. Um, the longest relationship that you will have is with a sibling. Um, it's a shared experiences and memories, teach and learn from one another. And then it's really about where we first learn relationship skills. We, we learn first with our parents, but when there's a sibling, we learn those communication, behavior, and social emotional skills. So, I'm assuming that um, at least some of you did not have great sibling relationships. Um, not all of them are, are, you know, flowers and roses. And, and even within your sibling relationships, you can have issues across siblings. I come from a family of eight siblings. Not everybody got along. Not everybody gets along. Um, and so these are some of the some of the influences that we need to think about as, as we think about what's in the best interest of a child when we're talking about placement. What's the age range of the SIBs? What's the family size? Where in the birth order is the child that, you know, that someone else might want? Um, have they been alone? Have they been an only child for an extended period of time? Maybe they're the oldest child. Maybe they're the youngest child. Maybe they're the middle child that was a little, you know, a little girl, like this picture here, um, and the boys all went to one home and the little girl went to another home. That's your gender comp composition. Um, also, what is the quality of the parent, and I just said this earlier, the parental and the sibling relationships. What is the maltreatment exposure? Sibling relationships can look very different depending on what the maltreatment history is. Was, you know, if you look at these four children, was one of these four children the targeted child? And so that relationship may look very different. Was the older boy the primary caregiver for the younger three because of the parents' issues? So that maltreatment exposure and that history in our system really has to be, um, you know, thought through about what is the, is it a risk or is it a protective influence um, that will help the child persevere in whatever placement we decide to put him or her in? So this is a, a big one for me, um, why siblings should be together. Um, our failures as a system should not cause sibs to not be placed together. I get, I, and I tell people this all the time, I get that we may not have a placement when kids are removed. Think about my family of eight with five, five older ones, three big younger ones. I get that they, you know, that if my family were to come into the system today, there probably would not be, other than a group home situation of even that, a place that we could not be put together initially. But if the system failed, to continue to try to find us a placement. And even if they can't find that placement for us, they failed in making sure we had visitation, making sure we were utilizing technology to see each other um, as a group, 
not as you know subsections. We came in as a group. We are a group. Um, that should not, in the end, that should not be the reason that I can't go back and be with my sibs. Because we, you know, and, and I'm, you know, I was telling folks earlier, I, I sometimes am just too direct. If we can't get our act together, then then SIB should not have to suffer the consequences. Um, and so if you look at the sibling relationships, you know, that support, improvement, and outcomes, and you know, put yourself in the situation of being removed from a home from your parents and granted you have may, may have been seeing things for a while that you did or did not know were unhealthy, but you're removed from your parents and you're also removed from your siblings. That sibling may be the protective factor for you, um, especially after you've been removed and go back to that trauma and that ACE piece. Um, we un unwillingly re-traumatize by, by separating the kids. And so what we know is, we know from a, a looking at outcomes, we have better well-being outcomes when siblings stay together. If, if we preserve the ties and we buffer the children from the negative effects of the maltreatment and the removal from homes by keeping them together. And when we don't keep them together, there is all types of research out there um, to suggest that they, they have some profound feelings of leaf, uh, grief and loss and go back to that attachment and attunement that when we break those attachments, even if the attachment is the sibling, remember I set, set the stage for all future relationships. It's that ability to trust, um, trust in relationships. We also know if we keep siblings together, um, it increases the likelihood of achieving permanency and stability faster, whether they're in a foster home or in a kinship home. We also know that it's uh, higher rates of reunification, adoption, and guardianship if we keep the siblings together. And I think I just showed you that with our own numbers. Um, siblings placed together are more likely to exit to adoption and guardianship than if they're placed apart. And then children placed with their siblings also experience at least as much placement stability, if not more, than those were separated from their siblings. And so, you know, there's, there's all kind of data out there to support that we keep siblings together. Um, and so this is where I want to take a break because now we're going to run, we're going to start talking about what happens when we can't do it. So when we, we think about, um, you know, these, these hard to place kids, I kind of just went through, um, through it with you, the sibling group size, the age, the gender, the severity of the relationship um, with the parents and the sibs, um, the willingness of the foster parents to take a sibling group. Um, and a lot of times the easier alternative is, is that group care. And so some of the challenges that you, you know, you may come across is, you know, we want to prioritize keeping kids, um, you know, together whenever we can. But there, but there are times when we do have to make an assessment, make that hard decision um, to, to weigh the, the risk versus the advantages. And, and, you know, if you think kind of as a, a, a rule of thumb, if there is a risk to, to one of the children in the family due to physical, sexual, or verbal abuse. Um, the literature says, you know, control with a plan in place to ensure the safety of the, the siblings. But I'm going to tell you from a clinical perspective, it's really important that you do on some of these cases, especially with the physical and the sexual abuse cases of siblings that you really have a, um, a, a clinical person on your MDT if you're going to have an MDT or as a GAL volunteer or a CAM if you're concerned, bring in a clinical person, let that clinical person help you with, with formulating some of your ideas. And this is where that, that assessment piece um, comes into play. And so as you're doing an assessment, whether it's an assessment to keep siblings together, get siblings together, or remove a sibling from a 
a sibling group, it's really important that you consider the sibling group as a whole, um, even those siblings that aren't placed together because the law, the law says that we need to make dil diligent efforts up front and throughout to get those siblings placed back together. And what we don't want to do is get to the, the time where we're trying to reunify and we know that we've not made a plan for that that child that may need um you know may need their own home because of some of the abuse issues um you know especially those child on child sexual abuse issues um and so as you do that assessment you want to talk directly to the children um about it especially when you have histories of abuse um child on child abuse making sure that you've assessed what their thoughts and fears are about being reunited, um, making sure you assess the differences in the needs of the siblings and, and assessing the impact of placing when entrance into care is at different times. So for example, we had a, um, we had a case over in Northwest, I'm from the Northwest, where a, a, a female 14 year old sexually acted out on kids she did not she was not placed with a sibling this is a case of there was not a connecting of the dots early on that she had a a half sibling the half sibling comes in she is in a foster home where um she had been in a foster home for quite a while so that the younger sibling is coming in Entrance of care is at a different time. It was decided that because they were siblings, because this girl had lived alone um, and had not acted out, that they would go ahead and put the smaller child in, the smaller sibling, younger sibling. And I think all of you can figure out what happened. Um, we did not have, there was not a safety plan in place. The, the foster parents, were not equipped um you know and so those that that assessment of walking through the the what if drills if you will and i'm going to talk a little bit you know toward the end about the importance of transitions if we would have transitioned the child right through an incremental process and had more time to observe their relationship i think we would not have had the same outcome that we had um, Anyway, so, so as we're assessing, we want to assess the quality of the sibling group relationship, how they support each other and what those quality interactions are. And that goes back to transitioning sibling groups back together, um, depending on how long they've been apart, depending on the, the quality of the relationship. It may take some time to get there from here um, if we want to try to maintain and sustain that that sibling relationships um, and then really doing a true assessment of is there a true lack of foster homes that can accommodate sibling groups and what can you do to build that you know what can we do to help build you know a foster home capacity but also as a you know, as a CAM and a, you know, as a volunteer, if you're out there and you know that beds are opening up in a home because of reunification, you might want to think about, hey, wait, I've, I've got the Babcock, the three Babcock kids. There's now three beds over here. I need to find if we can move them over here and get them here together. And this goes back to that, that system of care and this, this piece right here, the best practice, the check and balance that we all can do. Um, Obviously, and especially with FFPSA, we've got to really start pushing on this whole kinship care. Um, we want to make sure that that whenever we can, we try to identify a relative first. And if we can't identify a relative, we can identify a foster home, place them nearby, place them in the same neighborhood, the same school district, so it helps them see each other regularly. Um, ensure those regular visits occur. And this is once again, um, you know, where the volunteers and the CAMs, you can be fighting for these frequent visitations um, and then making sure that there's someone there to help the children with their emotions. Like I said earlier, think about the grief loss that they go through. I've lost my parent, you know, I've 
lost my parents and now I've, I've lost my siblings and think about how incredibly hard it must be for those large sibling groups where kids are maybe broken into three. Um, and I've also seen where kids were broken into two groups of two and one by the baby by himself. Um, and so somebody has to help these kids deal with the emotion of this, that the system has brought on to them. Um, making sure that as you're doing your training, that you really stress the importance of pre-service uh, in pre-service of sibling connections, having having in services like these, because I think sometimes we get, you know, I was saying earlier um, before we started, I think sometimes we forget. Um, we have kids that that they're in good placements and they're they're doing fine, and we sometimes forget that they have siblings in another placement, or or we think we'll do it when when we hit, we hit reunification, or we think we'll do it when they're TPR'd instead of throughout the entire process trying to get them back together. Um, this has been, for me, um, I come from the behavioral health world, and the second bullet is another piece that I'm trying to push through. Have a system in place to track the location and status of all siblings, including those currently in separate placements, have achieved permanency, aged out, or were formally placed with um, relatives or were not removed from the home. I call it length of stay. Um, I, I come from more of a, a hospital background, if you will, where we're really looking at what's the length of stay and having those length of stay staffings for these types of kids, the kids that are separated, the kids that are in group care. What is the length of stay? Why are they still in this situation? And what do we need to do to get them all, get them out of group care or get them back together. And if we're not going to do it for whatever reason, let's make sure that we understand what the reason is. And, you know, especially if we think we're not going to hit permanency, let's start planning early so that when it, when it, it's ready to happen, it's not a rip off the band-aid with the scab and everything underneath. We've, we rip off the band-aid, but there's been time for that, that wound to heal a little bit. Um, this is another piece that I still can't wrap my head around, um, to be really honest with you. Assign all siblings to the same caseworker, regardless of when they enter care. Um, it's like having your own family practice doctor, you know, that works with your family. So, you know, if you're able to do that on the GAL side, I think it will be very helpful. Um, and if not, making sure that they're, they're working closely with each other. Discuss sibling issues at er regular intervals with all relevant uh, individuals throughout the case. This goes back to that length of stay staffing, um, how we can work through some of the issues. There are cases that we will know up front that we're going to leave Johnny here and you know, baby Susie's out there and she's gonna go to another home. Having those conversations up front is critical. So as we, as we think about placing kids with foster families or permanent families, helping them assess what is their real capacity to care um, for, for a sibling group. And, and it's okay if they say, I don't know that I can get there, but, but it's, it's incumbent on us then to give them the services so that they can get there. Um, make sure that then this goes to the next piece, make sure that they receive information and access to sufficient resources, um, wrapping around we want our foster parents, our adoptive parents to be successful. If their kids are uh, separated in an emergency placement, make sure that we've stat once again, length of stay. Within one week, why are we not trying to get the kids together and or can we at least get them in the same neighborhood so that they can have regular contacts, um, which is my next one, <laughs> um, facilitate regular contact. Um, and this is that piece when I said earlier, if, if one person in the system, and this is one of the, the decision makers in the system, is not uh, bought into the game plan, then the, the, the game plan won't work. Um, and so caseworkers, whether it's a GAL, a um, you know, a case manager, a PI, and then I, I know I have some attorneys on the phone, I think I have some judges here, I think who, whoever is going to be the gatekeeper 
that role has to has to just every single contact that you have with these children and these families we're asking about placement of sibs together so when the time comes there's there's no surprise and there's been a um there's been a plan in place i do want to share um alan shared with me um the family stability act you know because i know the question has come up and does come up if i'm a foster parent and child's been with me for x amount of months and then there's a sibling out there that, and a foster parent foster adoptive parent who would take all of them does the sibling relationship trump everything else um and so there's you know it's a great question and i'm going to talk about best interest assessments but there is um the american legislative exchange council board of directors in 2000 19 um put forth what's called the family stability act and and you can just read the first line if the tpr is filed and the child has been in the home for more than nine more than nine months and the caregivers want to default adopt define them as victim kim absent evidence to the contrary the court the court may um presume that continuation of the child's placement with his or her current caregivers is in the best interest and so you, you do have to step back and think at what point do our foster homes, is that the best placement for our kids? And it, it goes back to my nieces came out of the hospital into that home. They know no other family. That is their family. Um, so I, I am gonna follow up on, on this and, and kind of track to see what states are out there. Um, and we are looking at some, you know, maybe a possibility of seeing what we might be able to do with um, this act in Florida as well. So best interest assessments. Um, as part of my prior, prior job, I was asked by the courts um, to do best interest as assessments, especially on these types of cases where you have two families um, that want a child and or a sibling group, or you have two families that want one child or two children, but not the other ones. And so, so as you think about placement assessments, um, and they can be formal placement assessments, I can tell you in the Northwest, the GAL attorneys were probably the ones that ordered them the most or requested them the most um, to assist them with assessing all the options. Um, and and the, uh, the key piece to this is there has to be one objective assessor um, someone who doesn't have a dog in the fight that can just go in and and look at all the all the sources plus the collateral sources, do multiple interviews and observations over time, look at the current status of the situation, and much like a adoptive home study or even a um, foster care home study, you're you're looking at not just the relationship, but your you know all the components that make up um, those reports. But you also have to think through from a predictive capability. And what I mean by that is you have to have somebody who is skilled enough to kind of step back and say, based on what I know, if we remove this child from this home at this time, this is what most likely will happen. And that, that is especially true of young kids. Um, looking at where they are from a developmental standpoint. You know, there, there are times in a, the developmental stages that, that if we removed a child, say, for example, between nine and 11 months, on a, on a, good, a good day, a blue sky day, um, that's just a bad time to remove kids because of the, you know, um, strain situation, if you will, um, the, the ability to really want to be with their parent has absolutely nothing to do with the other parent being awful. It has to be with that um, with that uh, developmental time frame. So really thinking through that with the focus of looking at adjustment, adaptation, and integration into whatever family that might be. And so that's that's the lens to think about where these kids need to be. And so when you think about whether it's you just going in and, and looking, you know, um, as a volunteer or a CAM or a supervisor, 
going in and looking at a relationship, it's really important that you look, you think about the impact of opportunity. I was just reading, I was just reading a best interest assessment um, a few weeks ago because some of those come come through me um, as my role as deputy, and it was very interesting. It was a best interest assessment having to do with separated siblings, and the assessment was only an assessment of one set of parents, not the other set of parents. The folks who were going, who wanted to adopt the child had not had the opportunity of having the interactions established in a relationship with them so that nobody really knew what the impact of an opportunity to, to establish a relationship with that child may or may not look like and their siblings, and which leads to the next thing the quality of time with the siblings. It could be that the siblings have been separated for a year because we, you know, we we found Aunt Susie, you know, in Miami and then the foster home could only take, you know, one of the kids. So the siblings have been separated for a year. We can't naturally assume that they 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 can't regroup and reestablish that sibling relationship. It's it's the impact of opportunity again. And it's it's our system, our system failing them. Um, which leads to my last one, you know, the length of the time in the setting. When you know, when you have kids that have been in a home two, three years, um, and they have established relationships with their parents, their siblings, their community, their schools. Um, we really have to step back and think about adjustment, adaptation, integration, and, and the trauma of removing that child at this point in their life. Um, what, how do you weigh a sibling relationship, a biological sibling relationship against a non-biological um, sibling relationship? And you, you obviously keep hearing this from me. Um, you know, and this time it's in bold that siblings should not bear the brunt of system failures. And, and I say that with not meaning any offense, but I do think that we as a system, we we fail kids in not in not thinking through the impact of not addressing this issue in particular very early on. And so as you think about transition planning. And I can get you um, some some good examples. There's great examples out there. This is the piece that I think just um, we could do so much better in the preparing in advance. Um, we typically know because of the way that you know the court system is um, and a way and the way our families work or don't work um, case plans. So as part of our separated sibling staffings, what are we doing? When are we having them? What are we doing when we are having them to prepare for different, different courses of action? Best case of scenario, all the kids come back together and they go back to mom and dad. What's our next best case scenario? What's our next best case scenario? So as we start to weave out best case, you know, each best case scenario and we land on the scenario that it's going to land on, we should have had some preparation in, in advance, um, and we should be starting to increase those visits, especially if we know we're going to remove a child from a home that they have been involved in. Um, I didn't have written on here, you know, and this is my, my Pollyanna thinking, if you will. Um, you know, I, I do believe that there, there is a, a place, um, people, place and time for co-parenting. I do believe that there are folks that if we worked hard enough on these transitions that we could get to a place where we where we co-parent um, for a while, just to make sure that it's about the child, not the parent. Um, because I, I, I totally understand the loss of the parent, but this is a system designed around the best interest of the child. And so if there's been a determination that the best interest of the child is to move. The best interest of, for the child is that we do it in a thoughtful, well-planned out, incremental transition schedule so that the child becomes more comfortable as time moves on. Um, and then my third bullet, they're offering clinical support to everyone who wants it. 
but especially, especially the child and the family that they're, the kids are going to, or the child that's going to remain in their home and not see the, um, the siblings as much. Uh, the, the grief loss that's experienced um, and, and the trauma that's experienced is, is pretty significant. And so we, it, we want to think about setting up our, our homes that our kids are going to transition to, setting them up for success. So let's put the wraparound services in that they need. Um, and specialized wraparound services if they're birth to three, get some infant mental health, child parent psychotherapy, PCIT, but get somebody in the home. And here's a really big one. And, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you, um, you know, once again, I just will tell you frankly, I hear so much about the child, you know, the child is traumatized, the child has experienced adjustment issues. We need to expect that. Not, it's not a good thing, but we need to expect that and not think that this will not work because the child is experiencing adjustment issues. It's going to happen. Um, anybody that's been a, a, a military spouse with a spouse coming and going um, as, a, as an adult, you experience adjustment issues. The kids experience adjustment issues. It's going to happen. We've got to, we as a system have to figure out a way to be there to support everybody that's involved. Um, and sometimes, sometimes we forget about that. We, we do, just do the movement and move on. That's all I have specific to, to that. I don't know if we want to do questions now. Um, I did want to talk to you all about well-being, um, your own well-being. So I don't know if we want to do questions now um, with siblings, and then I can spend some few minutes at the end with taking care of yourself. Sure, we can do questions now. That sounds like an amazing plan. We have lots of questions for you, Dr. Babcock. Okay. Um, all right, so we have a question. Is the prospect of toxic stress, and I think this is something about what you were just mentioning, is the prospect of toxic stress continue, excuse me, considered with keeping the siblings together and somehow helping resolve the lack of family bonds and connection? So could you ask me that again? I want to make sure I understand what they're asking. Sure. Is the prospect of toxic stress considered with keeping the siblings together? Is that something that's considered and somehow helping resolve the lack of family bonds and connection? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. I, I think the the ability to place services in place, if I'm understanding the, you know, the, the question right, you know, and so do you do you remediate the toxic stress by offering the, the right type of services, for example? Um, I don't know if Mimi Graham's on here, but but PCIT, I mean, uh, CPP, child parent psychotherapy, if you offer that and, and you address the, the trauma that has happened, the generational trauma, that's a much better route to go to heal a family than to, to break up a family, if that's the question that's being asked. And then those kids that, you know, that, that maybe have experienced egregious um, abuse, we, we should want to help in the healing process there as well. So I'm thinking that's what you're asking. Should we address the toxic stress? Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, so there's a question about... Um, asking what is the plan to increase the number of foster homes as well as um, decrease the load on case managers and um, increase the number of transporters because i think people are seeing that all of these factors are contributing to lack of sibling connections right and i think you know i think covid has has taught us that we, we may not need to be in our car as much. Um, we still need to lay eyes on folks. Um, 
you know, and so from that that transporter perspective, you know, I, I don't know what GAL is doing, but I, I can tell you what we're doing and the CBCs are doing. We're, we're looking at where, you know, where can we minimize the ability to be on the road, but maximize um, maximize technology for some of those visits. The other piece too um, that COVID has shown us, and I, I apologize because we haven't been talking a lot to you all, has shown us on both the PI and the case management side that, that we may need to rethink the way that we do business. Um, from a going out into the home. So if you had four kids placed in a home and three families, two were two were siblings and the other two were two different families, we've got to start thinking strategically about can can a caseworker or a GAL or a volunteer take on all three of those families instead of having Four, you know, four people transporting or three people transporting. Um, you know, it's it's really like I said. I think COVID has shown us that that we might have the possibility of of doing business differently. And then, what was the first part of that question again? Um, a plan to increase foster parents and take the load off the case managers. Yeah, um, so a couple of things on the, the foster parents, that goes back to the faith and community um, and the, um, the, the hotline that we'll have for foster parents. So trying to find the right types of foster parents is I think is critical. Um, so like I said, right now, Eric is in contact with 32,000 churches um, if you think about, you know, we've already had that one church, one child, but if we really can make that happen, um, that that load there. The other piece, um, and when you say case manager, I don't know if they're case manager CBC or case case manager GAL or whatever, but the other the other piece that we're looking at from a system, and this has never made sense to me, um, so this is my push um, with Office of Child Welfare. When I was in um, services, I provided my services in the home. So I was in the home one or two times. I never understood why, why a case manager couldn't rely on my report. Um, you know, so having a case manager out there once a month or twice a month or three times a month. I, I never understood that. And so we're looking at, are there situations, um, whether it's a, you know, a lower risk or maybe even a diversion case where a service provider can enter into some type of contract so that they're providing a service so that the case manager can really case manage those cases that really need case management, if that makes sense. Yes, just working smarter, not yeah. harder. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we have a question. It's um, about the statute. And um, it says, it sounds to me as though the statute applies, and this may be the DCF administrative code that you put up, I'm not sure. But it sounds to me as though the statute applies to the initial placement for kids that every effort be made to keep them together. If they are not placed together, then sibling visitation be, should be maintained. But it does not seem to imply that kids who are separated and getting plenty of sibling visitation should all be removed from their stable placements for the purpose of placing them together. So this person wants you to confirm or set us straight on that. I'm writing it right now. So I don't see where it says that removal. It says the system should system should make every possible effort to place siblings together in the same out of home placement or if permanent, the same adoptive placement. So I don't see, so even if you have to use a shelter for short term group homes, you still wanna to try to get the kids together. And I agree, Dr. Babcock, if I can 
I'll, I'll help support you on that one. I, when I read the statute, you know, it talks about um, placing them together in the same home and in the event permanent placement of the siblings to place them in the same adoptive home. So again, that, that supports the notion that as we go through looking for our permanency options, we are to be looking for placements that will take all siblings together and place for them. So not only is it at the initial removal of the children that we are to strive to place them together, but as we continue to advocate for permanency from the very beginning, and that's what we're supposed to be doing is advocating for permanency from the beginning, because the statute also says that we are to strive to place the children together in a permanent home, we should be looking at that throughout the entire proceeding because that is ultimately the goal is to have them placed permanently together. So as we establish that permanency plan at every step along the way, we should be looking for that placement together. So I think the statute is very clear on that um, when it talks about not only the initial placement, but also the permanent placement of these children and having them placed together. One would naturally assume that that means you are to be looking for a placement at all junctures for them to be placed together. And, and, and sometimes, sometimes you ha have to wonder, do you need statute over common sense? Um, you know, good, good pra best practice, if you will, that, that we know, we know, we know, we know, we know that in, in most cases, siblings, when they are placed together, fare better across the span of a lifetime. So if, if we know that, that's just a standard of practice, a standard of care that, that we embrace, um, you know, as a system. All right, thank you. Um, so we have a question. Are there any situations where you would not recommend that siblings be placed together? Yeah, um, like I said earlier, that whenever there is a situation where there is a sibling that can harm a child, we just can't put a child in that situation. Um, and I would even go as far as, as saying that so that for me, that's an easy one, um, you know, especially if you have some untreated sexual aggression. Um, the I would even go as far as saying that that you do have situations where where children are, you know, my nieces, where children are born into a home, remain in that home, thrive in that home maybe even is adopted and or pre-adoptive and a years down the road, another sibling is born. I, I, I honestly, from a best interest standpoint, I can't wrap my head around removing a child from a stable, secure, loving environment, the only home they've known just to have siblings together. And, and I think, I, I know there are some um, some researchers that are very actively looking at that um, and looking at those situations where we've left children in the home. How how do they fare? Doesn't mean doesn't mean that they can't have a relationship with the sibling. I'm saying we don't remove them from a loving and stable home. Just like, just like you have good relationships with your cousins. I mean, some cousins are as close as siblings. Great, thank you. Okay, so we have a question that has to do with the Family Stability Act. And um, with that, foster parents are considered a best interest placement after the child has been in their care for nine months. However, ICPC, the Interstate Compact for Children Studies, take at least six months, but usually longer, extending the length of time children are in foster care and with siblings, who then may be separated based on whatever the outcome of the ICPC is. So how do we take the ICPC impact into consideration? I don't know that this, Act would 
would consider the ICPC, if I understood you right, because of the the time time involved, or it would have to be post ICPC, if I if I'm understanding you right. Okay, I think yeah, I think she was just saying that there's a a lapse in time with the ICPC because it does take a a long time. Right. Um. All right, let's see. Oh, Mimi Graham um, chimed in. She said, adjustment issues are reduced when there is ample transition planning rather than abrupt removals. Correct. Do you consider a sibling who was never involved with DCF any less of a sibling? Huh. Or any different in terms of importance in a child's life? No, I, 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 not unless they're, no. Okay. <laughs> All right, let me see if we got anything else. Um, here's one. Is the Sheriff's Youth Ranch considered a group home in regards to the 14-day rule? Hey, that's a great question, and I don't want to give the wrong answer. Um, I can just say that we're having conversations um, with them. So the way that, um, and whoever wrote that knows, so the way that FFPSA is, is going to work is um, we can only draw down for e dollars up to 14 days um, unless a child goes into one of those, those categories of approved um, group homes. You can have family-like um, group homes that have, you know, that have uh, parents that have, home parents, um, there's a term for it, but, but who have parents, it's not shift work. So we have been engaging um, not just the, the youth ranch, but some of the other foster home providers. Um, the, the reality is we are, we are going to have to have, there will be times when we, we will have to have somewhere to place children but we can no longer place them and leave them. Um, and so there's even been conversation and, and frankly, it, it's been um, pushed by me be because we, we are going to have such a finite amount of kids that are going to um, be in QRTPs or qual um, qualified residential treatment placements and are at risk homes that, that should we think about a 14 day a group home as a way to do a, a very thorough assessment on a child to figure out what is the best setting for this child. Like, can we build out our therapeutic group homes um, and or make sure that we have the right services in place? You know, think about how to do matching because I think everybody on this phone knows that what typically happens is you you, you have a you know, you you have a, a removal, a shelter, and, and you're scrambling trying to find, you know, a relative or a home, but sometimes you're scrambling so fast in the middle of the night, you don't have time. Um, and so you, you, you're you just doing the best you can. Let's all acknowledge that. But, but is there a way to kind of pump the brakes a little bit and give us some time to stop and think? So that think there's several states prior to FFPSA that have already done that. Um, they have, they're not using 14 day, they're using three to seven days. Um, and they are actually having much better stability, placement stability outcomes than other states are. Dr. Babcock, this is Mary Kay. And you, you spoke earlier about something with well being that you wanted to talk to us about that. So, can we go to that in our last few minutes? Yes, I would be thrilled to. Let me Thank bring you. it. You know, so like I said, I, I'm I'm a therapist by trade, um, and many years many years back, um, I I was a therapist in an office setting and got a call, received a call from Department of Defense. Um, they called it an all call. We we need help. Um, we we got a situation over in Germany. Um, folks were coming back from. Iraq, uh, everybody's standing on the tarmac and something happened in Iraq and people on the tarmac looked up and the loved ones watched the plane turn around 
and head back to Iraq. So I, I went over and spent three months at an army base um, and, and learned a whole lot about stuff. But the biggest thing I learned was that they, they live in a world of acronyms. Um, and so as I think about how do we, and especially now in this time of COVID, um, you know, we have very high stress jobs. You add the, the stress of working home, the stress of COVID and just life in general, but how do we, how do we take care of ourselves, but at the same time, make assessments of our coworkers, and I would say even make assessments of our family and the people that we are assessing. So while I was over there, I came up with this acronym HELP, and since then I've expanded it and have added more things. So, so if you think about the acronym HELP, um, and I'm going to walk through some things, you know, do you need help? How do you, how do you know when you need help? That was the biggest takeaway that I, I took when I was over in Germany, that folks just don't know when they, they need help. And so I developed this acronym. Um, your H is your harm or hurt self or others, hopeless, healthy and healthy habits. Your E is eating, exercise and excessive. L is love, leisure lethargy and P is persistent, pessimism, pleasure, passion, and people. So as you go through each letter, you know, I'll kind of, I'll kind of talk through them. I want you to kind of think about yourself, think about a colleague, think about somebody you're working with um, or somebody that you're concerned with, you know, and so if you've had thoughts in the last two weeks to harm or hurt yourself, you've got to stop now. <laughs> Um, this is you must seek help. It's not a you, you might want to seek help, but this is a you must seek help. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, if you've been feeling hopeless, like you have no options, um, no chance to change or improve, you know, these are these are red flags that I'm going to go through. If you're finding that your health is um, suffering from a what I call everyday illnesses, the colds, headaches, heart palpitations, GI issues, sleep issues. Um, chronic illnesses, if you have diabetes or blood pressure and you're having difficulty keeping that in control. Um, if you're drinking more than you should, um, the rule is one drink per day for a woman, two for men. Um, if you're binge drinking, you're drinking a woman four drinks in two hours and a man five drinks in two hours. You're smoking more than you should. You're misusing um, uh, prescription meds, but I really, I think we have an issue with folks misusing OT meds, specific those meds that are helping us sleep at night because of the stress that we're under because of, you know, our jobs and what life, what life that's going on right now. Um, I'm very honest to say that a few years ago, I, I went through a spell of, um, you know, just I needed help. My grandson was diagnosed with leukemia and then two months later, my father died unexpectedly and I found out that I can eat a whole box of honey buns, but I cannot eat a whole box of nutty bars in one sitting. Um, you know, so so my E, my eating, um, you know, overeating and gaining weight versus under eating and losing weight. Um, the exercise, some of us exercise all the time and we give it up. Um, when we're stressed out and others of us compensate and over-exercise um, and then the, the next E is that excessive worry. And so when I think about me back at that time, my, my do you need help all, all stemmed around E more than anything. Um, L is love. That's your meaningful relationships. Leisure is what do you what do you do in your spare time? If you're finding that your well, COVID is not allowing us to do a whole lot, but as, as it opens up, um, what are you doing? And which leads right into this lethargy. Are you out of energy, out of enthusiasm? Um, is it just hard to get up on a day-to-day -day basis? Your P, like I said earlier, if any of those is more than two weeks, that's that persistent piece. Um, you can see from the cartoon, just, if this is where you are, you know, that captain optimism and you're feeling more pessimistic, you know, I'll defeat you. Yeah, probably. You just, it's just not there. Um, you're looking at the worst of people, worst of outcomes. You've lost that pleasure, that happiness, the things that you used to really enjoy and make you happy. Just don't do the same thing. Um, you know, these are all red flags. And then this for me is the biggest one. Um, if you really have lost your passion, what is my, you know, what are my ambitions? What are my interests? If you've lost your way, 
and you've really seen it getting worse over the la last two weeks, then um, you, you, know, you really need to think about asking for help. But it all comes down to this last one, and I'm saying this tongue in cheek, and I'm sorry I can't see people's faces because I don't want you to take it the wrong way. Um, we all know in, um, in behavioral health, we all have all these acronyms, going back to acronyms. We've got ADD, ADHD, OCD, um, et cetera. Well, I think there needs to be an acronym called SAR, S-A-R, um, which stands for something ain't right. And so if the people around you are asking you, are you okay? The people that love you, are you okay? Something ain't right with you. Um, physically, you're just not there. Social, emotionally, cognitively, your brain's foggy. Those last two, the passion and people piece, that is a huge, huge red flag. That is people, people telling you, I'm attuned to what's going on with you and I, I'm concerned. Um, and so as you think about where you are, um, you know, as I just said that I'm talking through this fast, you know, we talk so much in, in child welfare about the stages of change, you know, and so as we ask for help, we typically are at the pre-contemplation or contemplation stage, and it takes us a while to prepare and turn into action, but unfortunately, even with self-care, we relapse because it's Groundhog Day. Every day we just keep doing the same thing over and over instead of making some real changes. So what do we know? Um, what do we know about compassion fatigue and the mind-body connection? You guys, I hope you know this, that, that it, is, it can be chronic physical and emotional exhaustion. Um, you can just be irritable, have feelings of self-contempt, difficulty sleeping, weight loss, headaches, um, poor job dissatisfaction, this depersonalization. I just don't even know why I'm here. I'm just kind of backing out. Um, for those of you that are, you know, I, I call it a therapeutic relationship. I think all of our relationships, you don't have to be a therapist to be in a therapeutic or caregiver relationship. If you're just not feeling it, um, just don't feel like you've got the the handle on it that you would like to have it, it it's it's your body telling you um, you've got something going on and you guys can read all this but I think you know um, I, I'd be willing to bet every person on this phone has felt some on this uh, webinar has felt some sense of stress and anxiety and you, you see all the the physical symptoms um, and the cognitive symptoms and as you, as you think about the jobs that we do um, we, we we don't have the luxury of, you know, having difficulty, con you know, concentrating the confusion, just this feeling of dread, um, the fatigue, the headaches. Um, we we just keep on plugging away. And so here's the, the healthy ways um, to deal with it, you know, with the disclaimer that it's hard to do. Um, the first one is always, always, always rule out something physical. I'll tell you a true story that just happened three weeks ago. Um, my husband just feeling really run down. Um, I was concerned just with some other things that maybe he was depressed. So I nagged him until he went to the doctor and he had two lungs that both had blood clots in them and a blood clot in his leg. Um, so I was so off the mark, but it, we ruled out something physical. Um, he feels much better. He's back here, back to himself. He's, he's forcing himself to take care of himself. Um, we talk to each other, you know, find somebody to talk to. And that person can be, you know, a friend, a clergy, you know, a spouse, just find somebody to talk to. Um, they pick up a phone and call a helpline. EAP, use the, um, the help text line. And this is a big one. When, when, we're, when we're in a state where we've got a lot of red flags, the best thing we can do is avoid drugs and alcohol. But unfortunately, a lot of times, um, we 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 turn to it um just take a break you we all could take a break but we i call it a workcation um doesn't mean you have to go on a vacation you can go on a workcation where maybe you just say hey every day can i just throughout the day take four hours just for me i'll, I'll add all my hours up but it might be incremental i know there's meetings i have to go to but but i need a break i need a workcation um, indulge in physical activity, all kinds of science out there that physical activity um, can decrease the, um, the symptoms of depression, 
get more sleep, hard to do when your brain's running all around the place. And I will say this to you, don't go over the counter, go talk to your doctor. And if you have to get, get something to give you a couple of good nights sleep, what we know about depression and anxiety, it's directly related to sleep. Um, it's no brainer. If you've ever been depressed or had anxiety, the, the, the less sleep you get, the more anxious you get, the more depressed, the more irritable, et cetera. Um, try some relaxation medi uh, or meditation. I can find out, Alan and um, some of the leadership folks, we have hired a wellness um, director and she has Mental Health Mondays and on Wednesday she does meditation. There is some way that folks are able to tap into it outside of the agency. If you think that's something you all want to do, I highly recommend you tap into us if you don't have it. Um, she's also teaching mindfulness during the week, uh, keeping a stress diary journal, uh, going ma manage your time, taking your break. And this is this is the big one. We all have a hard time saying no. I know some of you on the phone that know me are just laughing right now and saying I, I need to practice what I preach, but I, I am getting better at that. And then this is the big one. You just can't be afraid to ask for help. Um, our, our folks that we work with, they need us to be on our game. Um, and so we need to be on our game. And when I say our folks that we work with, I mean our families, I mean the people that you truly work with, I mean your communities, everything that you do, that's work, relationships are work. And so, you know, really getting on your game. Um, and so as you think about what's stopping you from doing it, because all of you right now are listening and saying, I need to do this, um, make sure that you really think through your need for control, um, trying to figure out what is the problem, what truly is the problem and the stressor. Um, is it something that you truly can own? Um, what is the change that you want to make? Because if you don't know where you want to get, you're not going to land anywhere. What are the barriers in place? Um, what's your plan for relapse? Remember what I said, everybody falls back into that routine, but you just keep picking back up and going. Um, who's on your accountability team? And what's your change plan? And this is the biggest one. When's your commitment to start? and when's your commitment to finish? And so this is just a quick diagram that shows you that what we're really trying to do is change behavior. And it's the environmental and the personal factors that feed into our ability to change behavior or our, or our inability to change behavior. So um, just most of us at some point or another, you might be right there right now, just holding on by a thread and letting go. Um, it is what it is. Sometimes we just have to accept it. Um, you got to learn to control what you can. Um, don't sweat the small stuff. But don't let it become big stuff. Listen to your own change talk. We talk so much about change talk. You know, what are you doing with your own change talk? Forgive yourself for whatever it is that you need to forgive yourself for. Um, <laughs> life sometimes stinks and sometimes that's really hard to accept. You know, so you, you just wear more deodorant and, and move on. And that is as good as it's going to get. Um, some people don't want to hear it, but sometimes the things are so out of our control that it truly is as good as we're going to get. Um, so anyway, that's very quickly. But I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the work that you all do. I will tell you that the um, Jonathan, the young man that, that we, you know, we didn't officially adopt, he will tell you to this day that a guardian ad litem saved his life, um, that he was ready to kill himself because he truly felt like nobody cared. And it was a guardian ad litem who just happened to show up at his door. Um, he knew her and she changed his life. And to this day, we're talking 15 years later, he still has a relationship with her. So I appreciate what you all do. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions or comments, but if there's, you know, anything you need from me, my email is patricia.babcock at myflfamilies.com. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Secretary. We appreciate it. And I think one of the great things about having done this is that we have, if we have a complicated case, we can make sure the people, the team making the decisions uh, can, can take a look at this and reflect back on what the training is. 
Um, I also appreciate the story about your guardian ad litem. Uh, there's some people out there that think, uh, you know, we've we've been under attack a couple times by this slight major minority of people that if they are successful, they were her children. That's and everyone knows it. Everyone that works in the system understands that if they keep attacking, we were on over 39,000 children's cases last year, and we're not perfect. Uh, we do the best we can, and our volunteers are amazing, and our staff are so dedicated. I'm so glad you did the wellness thing at the end to really let our staff understand that. We've been doing that internally also. I just hope when you have yoga, you have goat yoga. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'm not going to go. I need goat <laughs> yoga. Anyway, but thanks a lot. Kristen, you want to say anything? Wrap it up? Yeah, I just... I want to echo Alan's sentiments and thank you, Dr. Babcock. This has been an amazing presentation and the timeliness of it was so important. Um, we had over 500 volunteers and staff members join us today. So I just really appreciate you being here with us and we're going to place it on our I Am For The Child Academy. So anyone who wasn't able to join us today can watch it and you know we can have that reminder and we can refer back to the lessons that you've taught us today and how can we make sure that we incorporate those aspects into our advocacy because advocating for siblings and their relationships and their placement together is so cru crucial for our children. And as their representative, it's really important that we are advocating for that from, the, from day one. And so I thank you for all of the knowledge today. I know they will serve as great tools for our team out in the field. And so thank you so very much. And the mindfulness um, section at the end was so important. We've already gotten several comments thanking, thanking you so much for the entire presentation, but also focusing on how to take care of ourselves. This is a difficult field, whether it's in times of COVID or not, and sometimes making those decisions or those recommendations can be tough. And just to remember to give yourself grace and to take a, a, a deep breath and to move forward is really important. So thank you so very much for that. And um, I really appreciate you joining us today. Well, thank you. Thank you guys. Um, keep doing the good work. Thank you. It's a wonderful thank partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye.